can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Jean-Pierre Lacroix of SLD.com. And JP, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes of the podcast people should check out. Um, I did one, you know, JP has been in this industry for several decades. I don't want to age you. JP, but um, there was another interesting one, Kevin Hurrigan of Spinatech. He had an agency since 1995. JP beat him in this regard. Um, that was a really good one. Just seeing the evolution of the the online space, the industry, and everything else, which we'll talk about on this. Um, I had one with Todd Tasky. Todd Tasky actually um, has the Second Bite podcast. He helps pair private equity with agencies, and sometimes he finds they make more when the second bite than they do on the first. So he basically talked about valuations, agencies, what people were um, working on and how they can best sell their company. So that was an interesting episode and he's got some great guests who have sold their agencies. So those are good ones as well. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the full strategy, full accountability, and the execution uh, for the podcast. Uh, JP, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company so they could just, you know, produce the content and, you know, run their business and not have to worry about all the other things. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. You can email us, support at rise25.com. I'm excited to introduce Jean-Pierre Lacroix, and he's the president and uh, of the branding and design firm uh, Shika- Shikatani. I got it right the first time. Shikatani and Lacroix. And their website, you can tell how experienced they're you know, a company is by their domain name, right? Their domain name is sld.com. That, you know, again, probably back in the day, it wasn't as tough to get something like that as it is now. So, uh, but sld.com, they started back in 1989 and maintain a focus on the latest and emerging trends. They've helped Fortune 500 companies transform their brands and organizations through the unique think blank process, which we'll talk about. It combines strategic foresight, design innovation, and consumer experience engineering. So JP, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you, Jeremy. And it's great to be here and share some of the insights uh, that we've uh, accumulated over the many years, actually 34 years to be exact. And, um, and this is my second company. So I've been in the design industry and branding industry for over 42 years. Wow. So seen a lot, done a lot, learned a lot. Talk about SLD and what you do a little bit. And if you're watching the video, you could see I have their website up here. You could see the Think Blink, and we'll we'll scroll through some of the the things uh, here. We see Let's Go Raptors, Coors Light, Regions Bank. Um, talk to people and tell them what what you do. Yeah, so we are a brand transformation agency. So we help brands ensure that they remain relevant in the marketplace, and we do that through. A uh, very thorough strategic process that's linked to great creative. And so Think Blink is the foundation of our gestalt. Um, we coined the phrase uh, close to 34 years ago called uh, uh, Blink Factor. And we did that. And ironically, we coined that phrase doing work for Pizza Hut US, and people called it the Red Roof, and that got our attention. And then we started looking at, you know, why do people call it Red Roof and how, why is that important? We found out that uh, 40% of all communication is visual, 80% of that is color and shape. So when you think of great brands like Regions, they own a color and shape. KD owns blue. I mean, great brands own a specific color and shape. It helps them stand out. And now think back, you know, 
34 years ago, the average supermarket had 20,000 products. There are fewer retailers in the marketplace. And if you go now to the supermarket, there's close to 80,000 products. So think Blink and the Blink factor is actually more relevant today than it was even then, because consumers are kind of inundated with uh, you know, decisions, uh, complexity of choice. And Think Blink is giving that brand a shortcut into the emotion of the customer and into their pocketbook. And um, Think is the strategy side of our business where we do strategic foresight. Act. For example, we predicted the pandemic. I hate to say this, but we saw that trend uh, as part of a, every year we do uh, the top trends in the marketplace. And in 2018, we predicted the pandemic would be here. Uh, we were off by, uh, I think, six months. Blink is how do you connect that? Those what made you concepts? predict that? What were you well, saying? We do uh, interesting. We do a trend scan um, in the industry. We look at what's trending, some of the issues in the marketplace, what's in word count, you know, on the website and Google Words. What, you know, what is trending upwards? What's trending downwards? And uh, we're tracking climate change and impact of climate change. And one of the things that came up was the bird flu and some of the viruses that were growing in, in some of these kind of hot spots in the marketplace. And, you know, we had, we have an office in Shanghai and we were going to the wet markets. Uh, and we said, you know, this is just a perfect environment to incubate, you know, viruses. And we were, we were not that far off. So those are the insights, you know, and we do that every year. So if you go to our website, you can see what we predicted last year, see if how accurate we are. I think um, we're trending about, of the 20 predictions, we get about more than half of them right. Which page is it on the blog page or? Uh, it would be under it would be under blogs. Okay. Yeah. We'll and white up. papers are the studies we do. We have podcasts, publications. We've written many books. Uh for example, these are white papers. We just finished a major study for the banking industry on DEI, diversity inclusive, uh, both in retail. Uh, we did a big study on the customer ideal seamless experience. So, so we're very much, you know, our focus, you know, our mantra is inspire the future of customer experiences. You can't inspire companies if you don't provide them with insights on what are the trends shaping the marketplace. For example, in the banking industry, uh, they focus so much on digital transformation. They're missing the mark on driving what's, what is needed in the marketplace, which is alleviating the customer's financial anxiety. So advice plays an important role. I'll be speaking at a conference tomorrow in the banking industry on that. We talked about the circular economy for retailers. That's a growing trend happening in the marketplace. Again, these are all studies uh, that we we ask consumers their input very often we'll also, also ask industry leaders they give you some insights and we also do a lot of strategic foresights if you scroll down there there's one on the future of healthcare humanizing the health and wellness clinic where we actually have come up with concepts on what does the future of healthcare look like what does a hospital look like you know what what's happening in the marketplace where you're seeing a split between a critical health care and what I'll call wellness health care. And what does that look like in the marketplace? And what's driving those behaviors? What are the trends driving those behaviors? And so we get right into sharing those insights and those facts. And it follows a lot of our, what I call engagement models and the attract, transact, and retain. And we get into designing those. In some cases, we create virtual reality and we use neuroscience to validate. So it's not just what people are telling us, but it's also how they feel about those experiences. Because we know that you know more than 60% of all buying decisions or brand preference are driven by how we feel, not how we think. So it just gives you a glimpse. This was actually a wellness chain that we did in China. Uh, they're uh, three-story um, cosmetic surgery. We do a lot of work in the healthcare category, but it gives you a glimpse of our thinking this is part of our inspire the future. It helps us kind of frame where the future could be in these different scenarios. That makes it fun. Uh, you know, picture says a thousand words. And if we can visualize something, very often that's what people were able to create. You know, the more you can envision the future, the more you can create a bridge to that future. Talk about the think blink process. I mentioned it briefly, but I'm sure 
when companies come to you, you have a certain process that you've honed in on over a couple of decades. Yeah. You know, so very often a client will come to us with a challenge. We were, we've lost relevancy. If I look at m M&M Meats, a, a, a company that invented the frozen food vertical retail category were a pioneer in the marketplace for, for decades, but they lost their relevancy because the consumers, the young consumers, um, you know, it was a an environment where uh, you were you went to a counter and looked at the flyer and picked items in the flyer. And so the challenge is that number one, millennials and Gen Zs weren't shopping them. Number two is that they're only selling elements around the flyer. They had you know 450 products of which 20 to 30 percent of them are signature items that you can't find anywhere else. And so we the think process is who's the customer segment we're appealing to? What are the key drivers of the category? What are the unmet need states? How do we develop, you know, how do we drive value that isn't there in the marketplace today? Because you can buy some of these products or a lot of these products at a supermarket. Why would they come to MM? You know, what is it that would drive them to come to this retailer versus a supermarket? And then we look at the entire customer journey part of the think process. You know, where are the friction points? Where are the opportunity to pivot and drive value? And then we take all those insights, customer segmentation, value proposition, unmet needs. And then we translate that into execution, which is the blink factor, the blink. How do you connect with consumers in that split second decision-making process that is highly emotionally charged and is linking that strategy with the design and bringing them together? And this is a great example of an organization that's been on the growth path since we've done work for them. They're growing at 20 to 30% a year in a, in a very competitive marketplace. And they're competing with supermarkets. They're competing with convenience gas retailers. They're competing with uh, online venues. And so how do you differentiate yourself by providing advice on how to plan meals? You know, I've got 10 people coming over for dinner. You know, what should I have? What should I prepare? You know, what's the portion size I should provide? They provide all those great insights and great product. What were some of the friction points you discovered? Well, number one is uh, consumers when they they you know the average consumer when they're hosting guests they really don't understand you know what what are the the portions I should provide you know how many shrimps should I have you know you know how many appetizers should I provide um, you know what's the cook time that I need to have all these things because you know you're preparing these foods they need to they need to arrive hot when your guests are hungry and so you know we converted these you know sales individuals, uh, these retail clerks into uh, meal advisors and really helping the customer map that entire meal. How many guests are you having? You know, um, you know, do you have food allergies? All these things. And then we designed the store that starts with appetizers and goes across the vertical categories. What's your protein? You know, you know, what kind of dessert do you want? And that helps frame the journey with the customer, helps you know, eliminate the anxieties that they have on what should I serve, you know, what's going to go well with what, you know, the pairing of products. And that's what M and M Food Market have done a great job. They've really focused on those pain points and create an environment that is self-shop, where the clerk, the meal advisor can guide that customer through that journey. So the customer journey JP is also built into the physical space. So like if they're moving across, they can go, well, it kind of follows a logical, you know, when I'm in a grocery store, I'm like all over the place. Right. And so it's like, oh, here's the appetizers and goes towards like what, where you should be going in the order of the meal type of thing. Yes, absolutely. And, and more importantly, when you, when you look at the physical and digital transformation happening in the marketplace, when we did our seamless study for the bank industry, what we what we identified is that digital transformation actually ends at the retail door. It doesn't continue seamlessly into the physical environment. And so most organizations, retailers, and financial institutions, and the service industry have really put a lot of emphasis, you know, accelerated by COVID at their digital transformation. But they stopped at the door, right? And the reality is sales happen at retail. 
And so enabling and empowering the staff to have the right information at their fingertips about their customers and their customer preferences was missing. And this is what we are driving here for m and It's making that seamless experience from online to pick up at the store. And we did a store pickup way before COVID. And so they were well prepared during the pandemic to meet the needs of their customers. But that's because they had a seamless experience. And so when you think of grocery shopping, is it seamless? You know, on your on your mobile device, when you've selected the items that um, that you've planned for the week, uh, replenishment and also for meal meal solutions, is that connected to finding those products in the store? No, right. The reality is that they're separate. You know, retail. You think a supermarket. Their apps are really focused on either online deliver to the home or pick up at the store or self, self-serve self yourself at the retail. There's a disconnect between those. And I think retails who connect those two elements are going to succeed because that's the problem that customers are faced with. It's, it's this kind of seamless experience that connects everything together from their work. And we, we talk about that with the banking industry. And we say, you know, you've done a really good job of driving transactions and making that experience seamless. But how's that tied to advice? How does that drive financial advice, reducing the anxiety of customers who are banking with you? And the answer is very little. And that's the unfortunate thing. It doesn't happen in the branch. It's a product-driven, focused um, engagement model that financial institutions have. And that's where they're missing the boat. That's where the big opportunity is. And that's where the think blink process comes into mind. What are those unmet needs? And how do we deliver it from a physical and digital experience and actually human experience, the role of the staff? Yeah, and and um, I want you to walk through what you did with Regions Bank. I mean, I want to just emphasize, you know, this process applies to any industry. You know, like any industry, I would think, wants to understand the customer journey, wants to decrease friction points in that journey and everything like that. So if someone's listening, like, well, I'm not a supermarket. Well, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, what did you do with regions? How did this process apply to regions? Yeah, before I jump into regions, you know, great point you bring up. So we're agency of record for PepsiCo, for Kraft, uh, for Nestle Healthcare brand. Um, you know, somebody asked us, you know, what what is your position and value that you bring? And so we deal with you know, corporations uh, in their rebranding, uh, retailers in their rebranding banks, and also CPG, consumer packaged good brands. And our kind of play, place that we play is when change is required, transformation is required, how do we manage that effectively? And so in the case of regions, they're the largest regional financial institution. They were looking at expanding into non-region markets, markets where a region's brand doesn't isn't known or isn't established. And to do that, we really need to create an environment, we called it Project Beacon, where the branch would stand out. We didn't need as many locations because we created these destination locations for the financial institution with large drive throughs and the combination of wealth and conventional banking in one center. And this is an example. This is a branch in St. Louis. This is a this is a market where they they they, they were penetrating. And so we developed for them, a defensive strategy, entering new markets and a defensive strategy, protecting the markets they have. And part of that exercise is the fizzy digital looking at, you know, what's the newest technology in ATMs and ITMs and where, where does those technologies play in the customer journey? And then how do we convert the kind of the journey from a transaction focused journey into one that's more health and advice? You know, how do we empower these the CSRs, consumer representative agents, into um, universal bankers. And then what's the role of digital? You know, how do we make it tetherless? You know, how do we break down those barriers where the customer is willing to sit down and have a conversation? How do we eliminate the queue lines where customers feel comfortable? They know where they are in the queue, but they're comfortable to reading information about the company or services because we know through research that when customers are sitting down, they're more apt to, to read information about the, the organization. And so that was the entire journey. 
they've been transforming their branch network uh, since we did this. We did this about seven years ago. And we developed a channel strategy. We looked at, you know, flagship branches, uh, suburban branches, drive-through branches, self-serve branches where there's no tellers, and then micro branches. These are small community branches in line, in, in, you know, on a high street location. So giving them the toolkit that allowed them to deliver those experiences consistently across all of those moments of truth for their, for their customers. JB, how have you, you know, when we first got on, we were just talking through a few points and how have you been able to remain relevant, right? Looking back a couple of decades ago and, you know, yeah. Uh, I think I had Michael Gerber on, and I forgot what the small business stats are, but most don't last a year or five years. Like the, the percentage has greatly decreased, and, and you've been at it for a couple of decades. How have you been able, what were some of the evolutionary things you had to put in place to remain relevant? Well, first thing is we, uh, not only do we have trend analysis for our clients, but we do one for our, our company. So every year we, review you know what are the what are the needs that our clients have that are not being delivered by their other partners i use pepsico as an example we started the relationship on the tropicana business we've evolved from tropicana to their hc record for all their packaging on all their brands both food and beverage and then we saw an opportunity to uh, create life a digital life for their brand so we got hired to uh, developed their website for Tropicana and Motelier Water. And then they realized that, you know, that we have this thing called Think, which is strategic and positioning. And so we got involved in a developing positioning program for some of their brands. And we also run their innovation fair. Since we have capabilities to create these built environments, these physical experiences, so why don't you apply those principles to our annual innovation fair that we have that they host every year? And so... It's about doing an assessment of where are those needs that our clients and challenges that our clients are having. And a lot of those insights come from our research we do, like we did a research for one of our clients in the CPG brand on the circle economy, recycling. We did a big study for our CPG clients on rewards. What's the impact of rewards on purchase behavior? For banks and, and retailers, we've done a lot of work on digital the effectiveness of digital signage, employee engagement, training to, you know, seamless experience. And so these studies that we do for our clients and the industry are also studies that we look at where are those unmet needs that we can fill within our capability, range of capabilities that we can fill those needs. And that's kept us relevant. We've been doing, you know, Jeremy, we launched podcasts called Design Lounge 20 years ago. You know, when people didn't even know what a podcast was, you know, you talked about our SLD website. We were one of the first firms in Canada in our industry to have a website. People said, well, why would you want a website? You know, what, what would you use the website for? And I said, it's all about uh, creating uh, relevance and visibility in the marketplace. And uh, and you're right. And we get approached, you know, the most recent uh, was $20,000 for our domain name and you know, so that's not the value of that is much more than than the dollars. For sure. Talk about how you design these studies, right? You're doing them for your clients, you're doing them for yourself. What's the method that goes behind actually coming out with the study? Yeah, so we so we sit down with the, the client, we look at what, you know, based on the we map out the journey of the project and we identify the key insight, and then we do a discovery. Um, and we look at what information is available um, for us to be able to deliver that experience, that transformational experience. And very often, there'll be gaps in the information. You know, they don't have clear personas for their brand. They don't have a clear defined segmentation. Or maybe the segmentation was done 20 years or 15 years ago, no longer is relevant. And so we identify, here's the information we need. Here's the gap. And then here are some of the tools. And so Depending on the budget and the level of risk, we'll either, we have tools internally that we use. We have access to half a billion consumer respondents globally. But we'll also use uh, companies like Hotspecs, uh, uh, which we've been working with them for the last 25 years. They invented the emotional research 
They've developed tools to understand the emotive factors driving consumer behavior, which lines up with our brand. And so we'll work with the client based on budget, the level of risk, you know, what kind of insight tools. For the bank in China, Jishan Bank, um, where they were building a branch of the future, which was radically different than what was out in the marketplace, we convinced the client to do neuroscience and virtual reality. And so we, about a month before the branch opened, uh, we brought 20 bank customers into a cafe and we used uh, virtual reality goggles and neuroscience caps. And we asked them to go through the journey of that branch experience to evaluate where there could be some friction points or some anxiety points. And actually we then took them because the, the branch wasn't open, but it was complete. We took them through the physical branch with the cap on, but without the goggles. And then we correlated the same journeys to first validate the findings and then validate the technology. And we found out there was only a 10% difference in the variance between the real world and the virtual world. And the variances really resulted in smaller rooms where they couldn't navigate around the desk. That created that mental barriers that they didn't have that issue in the real world. But other than that, great response. So again, to answer your question, Jeremy, we take a look at what are the gaps in the insights. And those insights are also to help drive and, and eliminate biases. You know, most clients come to you with a challenge and they already have in their mind what they think the solution is. And it may be the right solution. Uh, very often it isn't. And so our role using insights is to debunk, debunk some of these biases so we get them on the right journey. In the case of Dairy Queen, DQ Grill and Chill, their bias was they thought developing a better burger experience similar to Burger King that they would win at the food. You know, when consumers thought of Dairy Queen, they never thought of them as food. They were like 21st on the line when it comes to purchase decision for food. We got, we had to move them to number one or two or three. So we did study where we, we evaluated the Burger King like and about five other concepts. And one of them was grill and chill and grill and chill won. And using those insights, we were able to educate the franchisees that the Burger King knockoff wasn't going to get them to where they need to be, but the grill and chill did. And that proved us to be 100% right. We, we tripled their sales, and they've been growing every year for the last 17 years in a category that's been declining. So it's the power of insights, and it's the power of aligning everyone's thinking to one direction. I want to talk about change management for a second. I know we were discussing it um, and, you know, making the change, you know, first you're doing discovery. Now it's the execution and not only execution in one, but across all of these places, how do you have the, like in the Dairy Queen example, actually, or in the bank example, you know, this advice and the actual process has to be uh, put out across all of the the people and in the branches. Yeah. So we did a big study in 2019 called Fizzy Digital for the banking and then one for the retail and one for healthcare. And what we found out is major transformational programs typically are run by one department. Maybe it's marketing, maybe it's operations, maybe it's facilities. And the challenge with that is that it's it's this siloed approach to transformation. This is their project. It's not our project. We're tagging along to their project. And when, when you start having that language internally, that it's their project, it's the marketing project, or it's the operations project, you're going to create some resistance internally at transformation. Because transformation means risk. It means change. Why do I need to change my processes for marketing? Or why should I change my processes for human resources or why human resources, why would I change my sales choreography because the facility changed? What's in it for me? And although we think altruistic about organizations, the reality, most organizations are very silo driven. So the task is to create a task force that brings all of these diverse individuals into one room and to create a journey that allows input along the entire process by all these stakeholders. So that, I always say the ultimate goal of transformation is no longer our idea. And it's no longer 
the idea of the champion department that brought us in. It's the idea of the organization that everyone had to say that this is going to move the entire organization, not just the department. And that's where transformation is successful. Where it fails is either it's top-down driven, we're going to do it this way, my way, or that it's aligned to a single group within, within the organization where other people are involved in advice, but they don't have a, a, a stake. And then finally, you know, what gets measured gets done, what gets rewarded gets repeated. So one of the key things we do at the front end of this is identify the key metrics that are going to drive transformation. We call that the trust ladder. We identify during this transformation that is done in steps, what are the metrics we need to measure that allows us to move to the next level of change? And those metrics cross the entire organization, you know, NPS scores, you know, employee engagement, customer engagement, uh, margin contribution, sales increase, visibility in the marketplace, you know, social engagement, all of these things play an important role at taking the brand to the next level of transformation. And we pick those transformations into steps. It's not one big step like JCPenney did. They lost the franchise, lost their customers. We do them in incremental steps to, towards a final vision. For your organization, how do you get everyone working and rowing in the same direction? What are the things you do? Well, we uh, one of our <clears throat> one of our we have four pillars. One of our pillars is inclusive. It's been there since the beginning of the company, and so if you came into our studio. Uh, you would see that we intersperse account people with creative, you know, environmental designers, we call them brand environment designers, visual designers, graphic designers, strategists. They're all mingled together. Um, and it's we put teams together on a project uh, and we solicit, the, if, like during brainstorming session, we solicit input from everyone, from the accounting department to the, you know, to the strategy team, to the creative team, to the account team. There's no bad idea and there's no there's no ownership of where those ideas need to come. And I think having that inclusive culture allows for diverse points of view. And I will say one of the other factors of failed transformation is that the organization didn't include diverse points of view. They've kind of filtered people who believe in the same thing, which is wrong. You need some challengers in those ideas to kind of set the agenda in the right direction. It's good to have people against what you're trying to do so that you can understand what is driving those, those challenges so that you can find out, do we need to do a course correction or, or, you know, or, or do, you, do we need to do a better selling job of the benefits of what we're trying to do? And so internally, it's inclusive. JP, let's go back to the beginning when you first started this, right? What were some of the, the client milestones, right? Now you work with huge brands. Right. What was it like in the beginning? How did you, what, what point did you have your first big breakthrough client? That's a great, Jeremy. That's a great question. <clears throat> Our, so the vision was always to be a global agency. So we work in, we've done work in about 40 countries. Um, but we didn't have a vehicle or a client that would allow us. And I still remember it was my birthday, August 18. About 35 years ago, just at the beginning of the company, Kodak came to us and they, they told us they were launching mini labs, you know, one hour photo labs. You remember those? And they want us to do the branding. And I remember my client was Ted Knight. He was head of promotion and said, Ted, you know, there's a bigger opportunity here. Why don't we brand the experience called Image Center? And why don't we license the right to use Kodak brand equity in return for selling 80 to 90 percent Kodak products? And he says, that's a brilliant idea. So we pitched the idea to the head office in Canada. And they, they liked the idea. And they hired us to come up with some concepts so that we could then pitch Eastman Kodak on developing that program. And they, and they bought in on the, on the concept. I still remember the opening of the Marriott Hotel. This was Kodak had a major conference. We built a prototype of the Kodak Image Center at the conference. And, uh, and we launched the program. And we did. Uh, 180 stores in the U.S. We did throughout Latin America. We did Kodak Commit Centers. We did work in, in Asia for them. We were about to open stores in Russia. 
Uh, and obviously in Canada, we did we did 600 stores in that journey. And so that allowed us to get on a, a kind of an internet or the flavor for international work. And that just continued from there. So Kodak was a pivotal one. Yeah. Let's talk on the hiring side, right? Yeah. That happens to an agency. It's amazing. But now there needs to be, <laughs> you're smiling because you know what I'm going to say. Yeah. You know, that has to come with people too and help release this. Talk about how do you manage bringing on a big client with the company and hiring? Yeah. So I, I think the first thing, Jeremy, that, you know, in my career, my journey, uh, you know, I think a lot of the culture of the company and kind of the vision of the company is driven by the founder. So I'm constantly always trying to improve myself. You know, I, I'm a feverish book reader. And when I interview people, the first question I ask them, what's the most compelling book you've read in your life? What book are you reading today? To me, it's a bellwether of, are, are you someone who has appetite for growth? Having said that, we have, I would say, 70% of the people in our company have been with us for over 10 years. I have, I'd say, 10 people who have been with me for 25 years. And they stick with us because we provide them with a diversity. One day they're working on a bank in China. The next day they may be working on an immersive experience in New York. They could be working the following week on a packaging project or a new identity program. And creative people like change. They like different challenges. They don't like doing the same job over and over again. And that's what we bring to the table. But we also look at, you know, what is the ask from the client? Who's the most qualified from a standpoint of fit for that client's task? And then we'll look at our team and assign those individuals. But the reality is from a strategy side, it's the same team working on strategy. And what, why that's important is I call it learned behavior. The more we can learn from different projects and different client challenges, the richer that library of execution becomes or that library of strategic insight comes. And that's really what we focus on. What were some of the key positions you had to put in place that you had to hire for? Like early on, I imagine it was a few people. What were some of the key positions you put in place uh, throughout the years? I think the 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 two two critical positions. One was a CFO. <clears throat> you know, I spend my time in meetings, presenting, strategizing, um, traveling. I need someone who's going to watch the pennies, right? And most companies fail because their cash flow. It's not because their sales are not there, because their cash flow is terrible, right? So I, I, I wanted the CFO to, you know, hold me accountable, tell me no when it's appropriate, and tell me yes when it's appropriate. So that was a key hire, and I made that person a shareholder in our company or a principal in our company. The other one's to have a head of creative that bridges all of our disciplines so that we could break down the silos. The worst thing I could do is have a VP of a brand environment, a VP of digital, a VP of graphics, a VP of strategy, but nothing linking them together and ensuring they work together. So uh, Richard joined our company uh, 25 years ago, and I made him EVP of creative and innovation in our company, and he's also a principal in the company. Those are the two critical hires. And then obviously, as we evolved, we hired somebody for digital a long time ago uh, and continue to to hire for that category. We have some brilliant people, both technology, scientists, and digital content. And then obviously strategy. You know, if I look back, we were always a strategy first agency, but I look back 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I was running strategy and I had, you know, the account team helping me, but I was leading that. Now we have an entire strategy team. Talk about the CFO for a second as an example. What's your thought on hiring within or looking outside? Versus, are, you know, I know some people like they want to cultivate people and they're moving them up as opposed to bringing someone in from the outside into that position. Well, we didn't have anybody. Well, first of all, the role that was there, the young lady that I had passed away in cancer. So we were forced into a situation where we needed to search for somebody and we didn't have the we didn't have the talent in-house. They were all junior 
they were executors, if you like, very talented, but executors. So we needed somebody from the outside. And I preferred to look at someone that had our industry experience. You know, bringing somebody from the banking industry or from the retail industry, yeah, they're very talented. But we're, we're um, you know, an industry that sells intellectual material, like non-tangible material. And so having someone who's been in and understands those dynamics is really important. So if you're going to hire a CFO in a critical role, I would look first, you know, are there gaps within your organization? In our case, there was. And number two is, you know, hire someone that can build on your weaknesses, your personal weaknesses as a founder, but also can help you manage those transitions. I mean, thank God we had our CFO, uh, you know, 28, 2008, you know, um, you know, and if I look back, COVID, I'm managing cash, all of those things, we came up profitable through COVID, which is unheard of. So understanding where your weaknesses are and having the right person is really important. If you talk about managing projects, these projects seem very big, very complicated. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious from maybe how do you run them as far as the teams go? You know, do you have certain pods or how do you how do you break that up? And then from a technology perspective, um, are there certain technology like using like, you know, CRMs and project management and, and SOP type of things um, on those two fronts, the the people side and then the, the technology side? So we're very much a client centric agency. And so clients want to deal with one individual within an organization. And so we'll always assign a key lead on the project. And the good news is our account team are have a have again similar to the designers have diverse experiences. And so our head of account uh, uh, account management on brand environments has strong digital experience, strong packaging experience. So they can run a private label program, they can run a digital program, and they can run the architectural part of the program. Right. And so we will always have a single point of accountability. Now, if it's a huge project, we will assign other account team members at the execution level of the project, but there'll always be one lead. And, and the client then has can focus on that individual. They have support within the organization. If that person's on traveling or that person's at another meeting, there's always a team here that the client's questions get answered. The second thing is that um but, you know, you ask clients to define our business, you know, 24 years ago, we did a private label program for the second largest retailer in Canada, Sobeys. Now, Sobeys located at the time in Stellotin. Stellotin was this small town. It was a mining town. About two and a half hour drive from Halifax, which is a three hour flight from Toronto. And we were doing 3000 SKUs, stock keeping units in a period of 17 months. And so intense communication management of project. And so we launched, as we pioneered web, we launched a thing called Team Client. And Team Client was a web-enabled project management platform that tracked everything we did from briefs, estimates briefs, timesheets, to content management, to email management. And that has stayed part of our our system, you know, it, there's nothing else like it. Uh, you know, it'd be easier for us to license some of these platforms. There's nothing like it. And we're in the process right now of moving that to the cloud. So it's going to be a cloud-based anywhere because we do work in China. We want to be able to have access to the network cloud-based. So that's where we're at now. And it's called Team Client. Tracks everything. So they're internal. You build internal tools, essentially, yeah. to manage it. Yeah. Now we use external CRM, you know, we use uh, SharpSpring for our email marketing. We had Salesforce. Now we use SharpSpring because we, you know, Salesforce is a great platform, but it's it's geared towards large companies, not for small firms like us. We also use Nimble, which is another CRM platform. It's a contact content management for our Salesforce. And then we use a, a social media platform called Meet Alfred, which is fantastic. That allows you to connect with your clients on social media like LinkedIn or, or Twitter. Love it. 
JP, um, I want to know, you know, you're mentioning uh, being an avid, you know, learner. Um, I'd love to hear some of your favorite books and mm-hmm. also mentors throughout the years. But but starting with books, what are some of your favorites um, that you recommend other business people to check out? Yeah, there's, you know, there, there are lots of books that kind of fill your I'll call it the gaps. And then there are what I'll call transformational books, books that have changed the way you operate. And one of them is called The Challenger Sale. And it's a series of three books. I think it's The Challenger Sale, The Challenger Client, and The Challenger Experience. And it's written by a consulting firm that have a very unique model. Um, and it's a foundation of our insights. And that is, where are the gaps in the marketplace? How do you provide a a contrarian or a unique perspective that would help align that aligns to your services, but that would solve a problem pain point for your clients. So that definitely traction is another great book, you know, creating these rocks. I think that's a great, it's a soft, it was written by someone who specialized in software, but it's a, you know, obviously a great book. And then I'm just reading one on, on, uh, Selling, believe it or not, I'm just refreshing myself on you know the techniques in selling, um, uh, you know, for everything from te- te- telephone conversations to email marketing. It's always good to refresh because the market is changing so rapidly, and I'm hungry always to stay relevant, stay in the know on what's happening. Do you have a favorite on selling, or I don't know what that one, if you remember the the title of that one. Oh, I have it here. I, hold on. Let me soak my iPad. I apologize yeah. if I fall off. Check screen. it out. No, um, as you're doing that, yeah, the traction, Gino Wickman, I actually had him on the podcast so people could check that uh, episode out that I did uh, with, with Gino. Um, and I'll have to check out the Challenger. I think a couple other people have mentioned that one. I haven't checked it out yet. So the the Challenger books sound really interesting too. Called Fanatical Prospecting by Jeff Blunt. Fanatical prospecting. Okay, awesome. And then there's a great, uh, you know, um, well, there's a lot of books. Uh, there's uh, one by uh, a book by David Baker. But David Baker is an expert in our industry. You asked me the second question. You know, to mentors and coaches, I would say the Blair ends uh, win without pitching and David Baker recourse are two industry gurus when it comes to um, uh, connecting and guiding us. Uh, and then there's collect there's Collective 54, which is a podcast which uh, really talks to the service, the uh, consulting. 54 is the designation for consulting firms, design firms, you know, lawyers, all of that. And so there's another great platform, uh, you know, for uh, yeah, those are. But I Actually, just that's up. that's funny you mentioned that because someone uh, in the last one of the last episodes uh, just recommended uh, the book from the the person who started Collective yeah. Fifty Four um, and the boutique, Greg Alexander. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I've got it here. I finished reading that book. It's a yep. great book. Yeah, there's no lack of. Of you know you need to focus if you're a vertical that's consulting, where you're selling intellectual capital, then there's you know you should focus on those because it is very different than being a manufacturer selling widgets. What about maybe colleagues, so mentors? You know they could yeah. be colleagues um, that have helped you or you know you've collaborated throughout the years. Yeah, well, Dave Baker did an assessment of our company 10 years ago and gave us a roadmap, just a kind of reality check. It was humbling. He can be a real humbling guy, believe me. <laughs> um, but we, for 10 years, had a um, gentleman, who, uh, Bruce Hunter, who uh, used to be my client at Kraft, uh, ended up leaving. He was part, he was head of acquisitions and, and marketing at one point. And he was he was uh, my coach. I'd meet him once a month, but he also joined our management meetings uh, for ten years, and uh, he held us accountable for like 
we have a, a fantastic employee handbook, right? Uh, help us codify our processes. Um, help us restructure the company. Uh, hold people accountable. And, you know, clear, clear definition of roles and responsibilities. Like the real fundamental stuff that we take for granted that it's intuitive, but it works against us because if it's not codified, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur, we like change. Right? What's the new hot toy, you know? So having those foundations really important. It gives consistency to uh, to our colleagues, our clients. Yeah. He's a great guy. JP, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey, your knowledge. I want to um, encourage people to check out sld.com and to learn more and more episodes of the podcast. And JP, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Have a great day. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.